So, I recorded this a couple days ago, and I actually think that I might have... You know what, I'll leave the webcam on for this. You know, I'll try and do, I'll try and do a little bit more with webcam on, or videos like this with a webcam on, because this is different than... Um, this is different than the content that I normally do on WWE 2K, but I recorded this a while back, and... Honestly, I'm not 100% sure what happened to it. I think I might have saved over it with a different file or accidentally deleted it thinking it was something else. I'm not 100% sure what I did with it, but a couple months ago, I did a video basically documenting the significance of Starcade 1987 and the effect that it had that it had on Jim Crockett Promotions. And that the cracks had already started to show within the ranks of Crockett Promotions. And by that I mean, within a year of Starcade, the following year, Crockett Promotions would not be under Crockett anymore. It would have been sold to Ted Turner. In my opinion, Fall Barrel 1997 is... A pay-per-view that carries the same significance. The reason is... The reason is because Fall Brawl 1997... You started seeing sprinkles of the cracks within WCW... And the over-reliance on the success of the NWO... And even though right around this time is when the streak started for Bill Goldberg... The over-reliance was clear. And the reason why I can say the over-reliance was clear is because if you look ahead, if you look ahead to Halloween Havoc, World War III, and Starcade, all the chips were pushed into the center for Starcade 1997 with WCW and Sting versus Hollywood Hogan, and that is why Hollywood Hogan is not defending his world championship tonight in any way, shape, or form. It is because War Games is the focus. And this actually would be one of, if not the last, official War Games match until WWE re, re, uh, gave the match type a new life and brought it back in NXT a couple years ago. I'm not pointing to Eddie and Jericho. I'm not pointing to the tag match between Rick St uh, the Steiner brothers and Harlem Heat. I am not pointing to Ultimo Dragon and Alex Wright, Jeff Jarrett and Dean Malenko, the Faces of Fear against Wrath and Mortis, the Giant versus Scott Norton. I am more or less pointing to the top two matches on the card, Dallas Page and Luger, against Savage and Hall, and then the NWO versus the Four Horsemen. And what I mean is, wh why I'm pinpointing both of those is, because if you look back at, if you look back at, um, where the story went from here, they left money on the table. They left money on the table, and that is the worst possible thing you can do in professional wrestling. I can understand why the tag team titles were not on the line on this broadcast. It is because the Outsiders were... Once again, tag team champions. And were in separate matches. Kevin was in War Games and Scott Hall was in a tag match with Randy Savage. But could have given a could have given us a number one contender match. 
Um, I believe Mongo at this time was United States champion, if I remember correctly. And this is coming off the heels of Arn Anderson giving Kurt Henning his spot in the Horseman and retiring from professional wrestling. And then, of course, it is also coming off the heels of the impersonation of Double A and the Horseman by the New World Order. Whether they enjoyed it or whether they didn't, it didn't matter. What matters is there was no comeuppance to the heels and no revenge for the Horseman following that. There was no revenge following that, and and you know the fact of the matter is it was the promo took place on the August twenty fifth edition of Nitro, either the following week or the week or the week either the, that next week or the week following, was when the parody took place by the NWO. You would have thought... You would have thought that maybe the Horsemen would get revenge and the Horsemen would have won and defeated the NWO... But as I mentioned earlier, if you look ahead, the horsemen, specifically Ric Flair, never got revenge. And I know that the question might be, why would Flair need revenge? If you don't know anything about Fall Brawl 1997, then you don't know that this is the night where the NWO neutered. The Horseman. The NWO handcuffed Benoit and Steve Mongo McMichael to the cage and insulted Ric Flair. Kevin Nash took the microphone and asked them to quit. Defiant till the end, they fought. They kept fighting like horsemen would. And then Nash threatened to slam Flair's head into the cage. Mongo, Mongo relented and let the match end. Henning then proceeded to slam Flair's head in the cage anyway, officially cementing himself as a heel. And one of the top heels in the New World Order. This, by the way, was done in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, prime Flair country. There's a reason why there's a reason why the Carolinas were as hot as they were for the Crockets. For as long as they were for the Crockets and as stable as they were. It's because if you treat them with respect and you give them wrestling, they will reward you with loyalty, they will reward you with money, and they will reward you with everything else, because that's what that damn fan base did. It was there for it. They wanted their professional wrestling. Not a soap opera, they wanted professional wrestling. Specifically, they loved the Nietzsche boy. So when Kurt Henning turned his back on the horseman, stabbed Flair in the back, and threw away the passionate promo that Double A cut, giving him his spot, he threw it all away and stabbed the horseman in the back. You would have thought that this is money. You would have thought that there was money all over it. 
But the following month at Halloween Havoc, Kurt Henning beat Ric Flair via disqualification. And then fast forward to World War Three. Fast forward to World War Three, and another match. Kurt Henning defeats Ric Flair, no disqualification, retaining the United States Championship. Henning and Flair surprise me with a good old-fashioned fight. Starcade Diamond Dallas Page gets a shot at the U.S. title and gets his goal, gets his hands on gold, defeating Kurt Henning, ending Flair versus Henning, ending what could have been a moneymaker and could have given some fans, I mean, it could have given fans something, something to sink their teeth into outside of Hogan versus Sting. It could have given, it could have taken the pressure off of Hogan and Sting. It could have taken the pressure off Nash and Hall to run the things with the Steiner brothers and Harlem Heat. It could have taken the pressure off of them. In my opinion, in my opinion, the biggest mistake that was made, the biggest mistake that was made was this may, w was not any particular match outside of maybe Wrath and Mortis and Faces of Fear going 12 minutes. It was not one particular match. It was what came out of the main event. And I'm not saying that the Horsemen should have gotten win after win after win after win after win. I'm not saying that Mongo should have beaten Kurt Henning or Benoit. I'm saying that if anybody should have beaten Kurt Henning and taken the belt off of Kurt Henning, it is Ric Flair. Don't get me wrong. Don't get it. Don't get it twisted. I don't believe that Diamond Dallas Page waiting until 1999 to win a world title was the right decision. But also, having Benoit in a feud with Kurt Henning could have elevated Chris Benoit. Having the horsemen without their leader could have been the reason why Kurt Henning kept winning. But to say that Flair, okay, fine. Numbers game gets the better of him at Halloween Havoc. But to say that he doesn't get any sort of revenge against Kurt Henning on pay-per-view when the lights are on the brightest and the nature boy can be the nature boy walking down the aisle with style and profile. Either it shows that they didn't believe in Flair or they didn't have a plan. I know this is Monday morning quarterbacking, but in my opinion, this pay-per-view started the downward trend for WCW toward where it inevitably ended up. I'm not saying that if WCW did, you know, changed a few bits and bobs here and there, that they could have survived. Their future was written in stone. It just hadn't revealed itself yet. The fact of the matter is... The fact of the matter is... This could have just put it off a little while longer. Because in 1995... In 1995, before... Or 1996, even before the invention of the NWO... It was not... NWO starts... Business picks up, ba 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 ba. It was where business slowly started changing and turning back in 1996, due in part to Ric Flair, due in part to Randy Savage.
it was the right time for something as big as the NWO, but it wasn't the only thing that turned the business around. I would have also split up the NWO's matches to where it's not one after the other with the NWO. Probably putting uh, Dallas and Luger against Savage and Hall in the fourth match. And moving Jared, against, uh, Jared and Dean into the seventh match instead. So what would I have done? I would have had Flair gone from television due to embarrassment. Due to just feeling embarrassed that they trusted Kurt Henning. And he stabbed him in the back. He tried to end the Nature Boy's career. And then Flair comes back after Halloween Havoc. And cuts a promo like only the Nature Boy could. Putting heading on blast for trying to kill the horsemen, but also pointing out that the horsemen have turned their back on people before. It's just that it's never been the opposite way, and it don't feel good. But in my opinion, you want Flair to lose the return match, go for it. Rage disqualification, he can't control himself, and he gets himself disqualified. But to say that Flair does not belong on the biggest show of the year, Ric Flair was not on Starcade. To say he doesn't belong on the biggest show of the year, with momentum on his side, heading into what was his feud in 1998 with Bret the Hitman Hart, it would have meant a hell of a lot more if Flair was carrying momentum. It would have meant a hell of a lot more if Chris Benoit was carrying momentum and he feuded with Bret Hart. If Bret Hart came in and wanted to fight the people that he never got the opportunity to fight before and start there and work his way up. You know, I'm not putting it towards anybody. I'm just saying, solid show. But the bigger picture wasn't in my, wasn't kept in mind. That's all I'm saying. And because the bigger picture was not kept in mind, it showed. Because Bret Hart feuding with Ric Flair over reputation on reputation alone only took it so far because Bret Hart didn't have a reputation within the ranks of WCW on par with the Nature Boy. But also, Ric Flair had a reputation that was in tatters after the end of 1997 because when you see your favorite never get revenge and you see your favorite get embarrassed over and over and over again to never get revenge on the person embarrassing him, it makes it hard to want to invest in the person that you think of as your favorite. Because he'll never win. You know, and if the goal was to split the NWO in 1998, if the goal was the Wolfpack and the Black and White, if the goal was Hogan on one side and Kevin Nash on the other, then why not have some holes be formed and tension be formed within the ranks of the New World Order in 1997 to start building up the anticipation of the split and to give a reason for the split? And in my opinion, then you have your match at Starcade next year. Kevin Nash, Hulk Hogan, one NWO will be left standing. You can have interference left and right. You can have bips and bobs and lefts and right and all that nonsense all together as long as the match ain't the main event. But with Bret the Hitman Hart walking through that door, you didn't need Hogan in the main event. Hell, if 
Kevin Nash and Hulk Hogan had their first meeting at Starcade 1998, their first face-to-face -face meeting, one-on-one -on -one contest, and you held it off until Starcade, building it up through the entire year, the anticipation of Hogan and Nash getting their hands on each other. It didn't need to be the main event. It could have been a double main event. And you say, well, what about Goldberg defending his title? What about DDP? What about Dallas instead? You know, and you pick and you pick apart. You pick it apart. You know, you could have Dallas. You could have Dallas do X, Y, and Z, and get a shot at the title in 1998. Because he had the momentum, he was hot. He was one of the hottest baby faces in the company next to Sting. You could have had him get a shot at the title and then go into a feud with another heel to keep him occupied until Starcade. Where he fights Goldberg, and instead of the match happening at Halloween Havoc, Goldberg versus Dallas Page, you have the match happen at Starcade. Because honestly, I think one of the few people nobody would complain about. Because of the story attached to it, I love how I'm talking about Starcade 1998 and we're at Fall Brawl 1997, but this is my point. If the bigger picture was put together, things would have been different. And again, I'm not blaming anybody. I'm not saying that this would have saved WCW. I'm just saying more money would have been made. The ratings would have been kept higher a little bit longer, and the inevitable would have just been put off a little longer. But the fact of the matter is, this is what we got from Star K from Fall Brawl 1997. And even though, you know, somebody on the other end might be saying, "Oh, I would have pulled this match," or "I would have pulled that match," let me know down in the comment section below if there is any, if the order of matches you would have changed, if there's any matches you would have gotten rid of and if you would have gotten rid of a match what match would you would you have pulled onto the card instead I would probably say if I would pull one match on the card I would probably pull a match representing the cruiserweight division because the cruiserweights always had a way of getting the crowd hot and if you're going to have a no holds barred tag team match on the card with war games, you need to have a nice separation. And I think having that match before between, because as I said, I would have put the tag team match, the Dallas Page and Luger against the NWO tag team match at four. I probably would have put, I probably would have put Alex Wright and the Ultimo Dragon at, at seven in the semi main because. It would have been that different. It would have been a mat-based... You would have seen the mat-based action back and forth, yada, 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 because Alec Wright didn't really dive, and, you know, Dragon did, but he was also a very good mat technician. So, I would have had that match in the semi-main because it would have been completely different than what you would have seen in the main event. But either way, let me know down in the comment section below if there's any changes you would have made. If you want me to keep going... If you don't want me to keep going, if you have any thoughts on what ha on the aftermath of War Games, if you agree, if you disagree, let me know down in the comment section below. And with that being said, I am done for the day, and I will see you in the next one.